as children grow into adulthood, we parents uh, often struggle with relating to them as adults. Has that ever happened to any of you parents out there? Your kids grew up and you, you struggled to relate to them as adults? Yeah, I see lots of shaking heads yes out there, lots of hands raised. You know, even though they, they grow up and they become independent and, you know, really capable people, sometimes it's, it's hard for us parents to not look at them and still see that same eight-year-old that, you know, we used to have to, you know, really, you know, get after and, you know, light a fire underneath them to get them moving, right? And it's understandable. We, we want to protect our kids, even when they're adults. We want to shield them from disappointment and suffering and of course, we want to tell them what to do, right? <laughs> and reasonably so. I mean, we've been through life. We know how difficult life is. We've made all the mistakes, right? And we, we want to help them, you know? But that doesn't always work very well, telling your kids what to do, does it? You know, if you're going to have a, a really uh, adult, functional relationship with your adult children, you have to learn to adapt. You have to learn to adapt to the reality of the change that has taken place in the lives of your children. And sometimes that's hard for us parents to, to do, isn't it? It's hard for us to admit that our, parent, or our kids have, have grown up and, and left the nest. You know, in a similar way, I think that the fact that the church has us read from the book of Revelation for, for, for five weeks after Easter, is the church's way of saying to us, this Jesus you follow has changed. This Jesus that you, you follow today is different from the Jesus before the crucifixion, even different than the Jesus after the resurrection, but before the ascension. And therefore, we must change how we relate to this new Jesus that's revealed in the book of Revelation. I think if you read closely there in Revelation, you will notice that when Jesus describes himself, it's always with highly symbolic language. And I think that signals to us that a radical change has taken place in this Jesus that we worship now. Um, a radical change from the Jesus of the Gospels. You know, when, when Jesus was walking in Galilee, he was very tangible. He was, um, he, he was to a certain extent, he, he was like a brother. In fact, you know, the scriptures use that term. You know, he, he was like a brother to us, right? But then, you know, he, he was crucified and he was, he was raised from the dead. And yet even there in those resurrection stories in the Gospels, we find a Jesus who's still a lot like us. He's, he's very human. Um, he hasn't changed that much. Well, he's, he's changed some. He can walk through doors. That's something new, right? <laughs> he's come from back from the dead. That's something really new, all right? But he still looks like the Jesus that walked the earth before the crucifixion. He, you know, he's still, you know, is very recognizable. But the Jesus we get today in the book of Revelation is like light years ahead of that, or light years away from, beyond that. That's the word I want. You light years beyond the book of Revelation is shouting at us to take seriously this new, transformed Jesus Christ, the crucified, risen one, ascended into heaven, glorified king of the universe. That's who Jesus is for us today. The book of Revelation um, was written down by the Apostle John. Uh, sometime after 90 A.D., maybe 90, 95 A.D. Um, you know, after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, and after you know, God poured out the Holy Spirit on the church, John and the other apostles took the gospel from Jerusalem into the rest of the Roman Empire. John eventually ended up in Ephesus, which is a town in western Asia Minor. Um, and there he became uh, like a bishop, uh, you know, an overseer of seven churches. And we, we mentioned them there in our, our uh, uh, scripture reading this morning. Smyrna, Pergamum, uh, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. 
uh, in addition to, to Ephesus. But as the years went by, the Roman government became increasingly hostile towards this new blossoming faith called Christianity. It was seen as an affront to the traditional pagan gods worshipped by the Romans. And it was seen as a real threat to what was called the imperial cult, which encouraged the worship of Roman emperors as gods. Revelation 1.9 tells us here this morning why John was arrested and banished as an exile to this work camp on the island of Patmos. He was banished there because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. What he means there is that he was banished to this work camp for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to whoever, whoever he, he, he came in contact with. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being thrown in jail for preaching the gospel? Now get this, uh, John, if you do the math, he was probably about 15 to 20 years old when Jesus first called him. If you do the math, 90, that means he was somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 or 80 years old when he was arrested, sent to this little damp Greek island to work in the mines. There was a, a mining operation uh, on the island. Well, as you can imagine, in, uh, in, a, in a Roman prison camp, they're not going to let you have church services. I mean, they didn't have a chaplain who came around and held services every Sunday. So the scripture tells us that one day, uh, the Lord's Day, which is the, the New Testament's way of saying Sunday, John was worshiping. Most likely, it was in private, or just a few of them had managed to get together. It says he was worshiping in the spirit. In other words, he had centered himself in praise and worship uh, and had began to commune with the Lord uh, in spirit. Um, if you go to Patmos today, there's a cave uh, where uh, it's uh, said in tradition that's where this revelation that John received occurred. So, so maybe him and a few others went off to a cave and began to worship in this cave. Well, at some point during this this meditation time that John is, is having, he hears a loud voice, and, and the scripture tells us it's like a trumpet behind him. And the voice says, write to your seven churches. Tell them what I am about to show you. I love the phrase here. It says that, that John turned around to see the voice. You know, to, to him, Jesus was a voice, you know, first and foremost. Jesus was the word. Remember, this, this same John wrote the first chapter of the Gospel of John where it says that Jesus was the word of God the, the, that became flesh and dwelt among us. So John turns around to see who's speaking to him, and what he sees causes him to fall down. Uh, it paralyzes him with awe and wonder. Sometimes, like when we're reading this story, it, it just doesn't do the story justice of what he saw, but what he saw was so amazing that it caused him to fall down uh, in, in, in fear, uh, fear of the Lord. The vision that he received clearly does not conform to our natural world. It was a supernatural vision. John describes this vision for us. He says he saw three lampstands. Well, again, our English doesn't do us justice here. What's really being referred to here is not those little poles with candles on the top of them that we have, you know, at Christmas time down the aisles here. What they really were were these great big pillars, probably two feet in diameter, standing up maybe six, eight feet tall. They had big brass bowls on the top of them with, with these uh, nozzles in them that have a big wick sticking out of them. And the bowls are filled with oil, and then they, they get lit, and they put off a really bright flame, a really tremendously bright flame. Now, there were seven of them in a circle, John tells us, and they would be giving off a very bright light. And they illuminate a figure in the middle, standing in the middle of these seven huge pillars with these lamps on the top of them. 
John is kind of at a loss for words. He says, I looked at this guy, and he was like a son of man. Well, what does that mean? Well, the word son of man is, is a, an Old Testament uh, prophetic word. It was used especially by Daniel to describe not just an ordinary human being, but an ordinary human being who's been endowed with extraordinary divine power and authority. Um, it's like, you know, this is like the Bible's version of the superhero. Okay? I, I, I call this a God-man. Jesus was a God-man. And I, that's really appropriate. You know, the church teaches that Jesus was 100% divine and 100% human all at the same time. So he was like a son of man, a God-man. And this God-man was dressed in a brilliantly bright, bright robe, right? Uh, which actually, you know, John had seen this, a glimpse of this before. You know, John was one of the three disciples that got taken up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And Jesus was transfigured there. And it said his white, uh, his robe became uh, a bright white raiment. Remember that? So John has, has really kind of seen a glimpse of this before. But now he's getting, you know, he's getting the full dose of it, all right? He's getting God in his full glory here in this vision. It says that he had this brilliantly white robe from his neck down to his ankles, and his feet were exposed, and his feet were like red-hot bronze. All right? He had a golden sash across his chest. And it said his hair was brilliantly white. You realize that? The, the resurrected, ascended, glorified Jesus has white hair. We don't see that in the pictures of the painting very often, do we? He had a brilliantly white, bright face. And it said he had a, a sword coming out of his mouth, all right? Now, when we think of swords, we think of little tiny swords, right? You know, you look, the kind you wear on, you know, do some sword fighting with. But that's not the sword that's coming out of his mouth. There's, there's two different word, two different Greek words for sword. And one is for that little short saber, which you might use in a sword fight. But this one that's mentioned here in Revelation is a sword that weighs upwards of 50 pounds. It's sometimes five to six feet long, and at the base of its hilt, it can be four to five inches uh, in, in, in uh, uh, width. And it takes two hands to wield the sword. I'm not sure I could do it. You know, I mean, it, it, takes, it takes two hands of somebody who's been you know, pumping some iron. You know, did you see uh, Debbie, your son, Jimmy? You know, he's really getting pumped up good. Um, he might be able to wield this sword with two hands, all right? Take a guy like that. So, and this, this sword is coming out of Jesus' mouth, all right? So what does all of that mean? Well, as I mentioned, this is symbolic language. Jesus is presenting himself in a symbolic way. Um, all of these things, the white robe, the golden sash, the sword coming out of his mouth, these are to indicate to us that he is the seat of divine power and authority. He has the power to forgive. He has the power to judge. That's really the, the meaning of these bright hot feet. I mean, he's, he's coming to judge, isn't he? All right. To make sure that John gets what's going on here. You know, Jesus reaches down and he touches him on the shoulder and he says, hey, get up. Don't be afraid. All right. I want you to know this. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive, never to die again. I hold the keys to death and hell. All right? Now, I want you to write that down and send it to all of your churches. Let's unpack what this vision means a little bit, all right? We've got these seven... Seven lampstands, burning bright. Okay, How many churches did John uh, pastor? Seven. All right. So each of these lampstands represents a church. All right. They got this bright light on the top. So what does that mean that the job of the church is? What's the job of the church? Do what? Do what? Yeah, yeah. To shine light into the darkness of the world. All right. That's our purpose. That's, that's why a church exists, to be a lampstand in the dark world. All right? Um, all right. And 
you know, at this time, as I mentioned, you know, the church was, was undergoing some great struggle. Some, you know, uh, it was being attacked from all sides. It was in the midst of turmoil and suffering and oppression. And what Jesus is saying to the churches is never forget you are the light of the world. All right? But it's not just up to you. Okay? You're not the light of the world alone. You have sister churches that are also the light of the world. But even more importantly, I, the Christ, the crucified, resurrected, ascended, glorified God-man, lives in the midst of your churches. Right? Jesus stands in the middle of our churches. And you know what he's doing? He's pouring oil into our lamps. All right? So how is it that we can find the strength and the courage to leave this place and to go out into the world and to proclaim the gospel? Even in the midst of you know, all kinds of resistance and, and all kinds of pushback from our culture, we can do it because Jesus is pouring lamps into our oil. He's pouring his spirit into our church. He's pouring spirit into our hearts. Can I get an amen? That is really good preaching. Yeah. All right, thank you. You know, that power, that power that's getting poured into our church is it proceeds from the Father and the Son, like we say in the Creed, right? The Holy Spirit, it proceeds from the Father and the Son. It's Christ who fills our ba basins. Christ is the source of of our power. And that's what Jesus is saying. You know, it's impossible for us to overestimate how important this encouragement was for the church in John's day. Um, the church was just under attack from all sides of its culture. The Jewish religion had been working tirelessly for decades to discredit the church in the eyes of the Roman government and had succeeded to a great extent. And the various pagan religions were very much against the church because the church required its members to, to give up its membership in these other pagan religions. You know, if you uh, lived in, in the Roman Empire, you could belong to as many different pagan religions as you wanted. In fact, it was encouraged that you belong to as many as possible. And then um, another kind of religion developed within the Roman Empire where the emperors themselves um, presented themselves as gods. And so they encouraged the people to venerate them as God. But what did the church teach? The church taught there is only one God, there is only one king, there is only one emperor, and that is not the emperor Hadrian or, or, or the emperor Nero. It's not these gods, Jupiter or Mars or or Athena, or whatever. It's, those, those aren't the real gods. There is one true God, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he stands in the middle of these churches. And he rules the universe. And for that, the church was persecuted. It was a dark time in church history. N never in its 65 years had the church been on the outside looking in as it was in the year 90 A.D. Does that sound at all familiar? It should. In many ways, our modern church has much in common with that late first century church of Asia Minor. Folks, we stand alone in our culture today. The state and the, the various other groups in our culture have been steadily backing away from the church, growing more and more antagonistic towards us, seeking to minimize the force of our message, seeking to marginalize our voice in the public square. And to this, Jesus appears to John. He appears as the exalted Christ and the king of the universe to say to the church of Jesus' day and to say to the church of our day, it doesn't matter what the rest of the world thinks about us or what the rest of the world does to us. I am the Lord of the church. I am still present. I am still empowering you to proclaim the good news. My presence, my grace, my power will be sufficient for you 
just as it was for John's church 1920 years ago. That's why we still read. That's why we still proclaim the book of Revelation in the church today. What Jesus told John in 90 AD is still true today. The exalted Christ still stands in the midst of our church. And we should never forget that. And by the way, what did this little ragtag of seven churches in Asia Minor do? Well, all they did was convert the entire Roman Empire. It took them less than 300 years after, after John's vision to convert the Roman Empire to Christianity. We have Christianity today in this spot because of what those seven churches did with John's vision. They took John's vision to heart and they boldly went out into their community and proclaimed the gospel, come what may. You see, God can take motley crews like us, can infuse us with his power and do great things. John's churches in Asia Minor proved that. So folks, it's time for us to dig deep, to get serious about being the church. Time to get on with being the business of being the kingdom, of living the kingdom, of building the kingdom of God here in our midst. All right, well, John has a lot more good stuff to say. Uh, he'll have more to say to us in the weeks to come. But for the moment, let's just, let's just savor that vision, that vision of Christ and the lampstands. All right? We are the lampstands. Christ is in our midst. Thanks be to God. Amen.